Thank you, Madam Chair, for this important meeting, and I thank our witnesses for being at the hearing today. Once again, we have a, a bundle of various initiatives, legislative proposals before the committee, generally related to the topic of energy supply. And in setting the context for the discussion, I think it's helpful to once again review what we just heard recently about the current supply picture. Last month from the Energy Information Agency, we heard that market conditions were expected through the year 2040 using current policies as a benchmark assumptions that first, growth in U.S. energy production combined with modest growth in demand will contribute to a decline in U.S. energy imports. And second, energy used by residential consumers in the transportation sector is expected to continue to decline, driven by improvements in energy efficiency technology. Meanwhile, the industrial sector is expected to post its strongest growth. So we're making strides. Third, electricity prices are expected to rise about 18%, driven primarily by fuel costs for natural gas and coal, which are expected to rise 88% and 25%, respectively. But with renewable technology, the fuel is free. And even while EIA has been criticized for underestimating growth in renewable energy production, the agency does project a 72% increase in clean energy generation between 2013 and 2014, accounting for more than a third of new capacity. So taken together, the set of findings suggest to me that the trajectory is generally positive from an energy security perspective, but it also uh, a good reason that the first quadrennial review on which Secretary Moniz testified last month, focused so heavily on energy infrastructure. To quote the Quadrennial Review, the focus was chosen because the dramatic changes in the U.S. energy landscape has significant implications for infrastructure needs and choices. Well-informed and forward-looking decisions that lead to more robust, more resilient infrastructure can enable substantial new economic consumer services, climate protection, and system reliability benefits. So based on the quadrennial energy review, I think there is good compelling case to be made that most pressing issue before the committee to address is modernizing our aging energy infrastructure. If there are specific priorities with respect to supply, they involve bending the cost curve even more sharply, downward on carbon, given the tremendous costs our climate is already imposing on business and communities across our country. From a competitive perspective, it also seems to me that we should be focused on supply-related policies that advanced energy technologies are going to be, that they are going to be comparatively less expensive in the future. According to the Department of Energy's 2014 revolutionary uh, report, by 2014, rooftop solar panels cost about 1% of what they did 35 years ago. Solar PV installations about 15 times what they were uh, less in 2008. So the report outlined similar trends on wind. The Department of Energy expects renewable costs to drop another 10 to 20 percent in the foreseeable future, and these projections don't even take into account the rapid technology changes that can further drive down the cost curve. Another example from my home state is the innovation in regards to turbines for our, our hydro system. BPA and the Army Corps of Engineers regional utilities have worked together on new designs that are optimizing fish survival rates and producing more power at the same time. And replacing these turbines at one particular dam achieved greater than 97% fish survival and 10 new turbines are updated to interface results that are going to serve an additional 12,000 homes. So energy efficiency is all across the board. So with these trends in mind, it's worth this committee's time and attention to focus on policies and programs that help accelerate U.S. leadership in energy supply technologies that will become a greater proportion of the resource mix both at home and globally. But given the projections about domestic oil and gas production under current law, the need to legislate lease sales for federal resources in the outer continental shelf is just not at all obvious to me. There is especially a time when I know what we're going to have a lot of choices to make when this committee and the situation, uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion also about the rationale to lift the current ban on crude exports. Um, but there are many lingering questions about the adequacy of our oil supply response capabilities and potential environmental act impacts. So the chair just mentioned this issue of revenue sharing. I want to note that the various revenue sharing proposals before this committee would give producing states a larger portion of money generated from the development of federal resources on the outer continental shelf. These are not new concepts, uh, my colleague from Louisiana I'm sure knows, but they are concepts that have been brought 
this committee to a standstill multiple locations given a mix of concerns and fiscal policy concerns, concerns from senators from interior states, concerns from adequate recovery of receipts on existing sales lease in the Gulf of Mexico. And already the harsh budget realities at the federal level are impacting efficiency of where we go about permitting energy infrastructure. So among the findings of the quadrennial review is what um, that has not received much attention is the fact that federal agencies responsible for infrastructure siting review and permitting have experienced dramatic appropriations cuts and reduced staff. And as a result, the overall effort to improve federal siting and permitting process has actually been stymied. So I do not discount the budget challenges that we face and for a variety of reasons, but the budget challenge at the federal level, which we're already impacting, is impacting the way that we actually permit energy infrastructure. And additionally, revenue sharing is difficult to then pencil out. So I just also want to take a moment to revisit something I mentioned earlier, which is the rising cost of coal. While coal costs are projected to go up 25%, coal exports are expected to increase 70% from 2015 to 2040. So I raise this because it's worth noting. In the West, you can typically lease a ton of coal from the BLM for $1 or less. That's $1 or less. So taxpayers get $1. Then years later, we have to deal with almost two tons of carbon dioxide from that one ton of carbon of coal. And the government's current best guess is that two tons of carbon pollution cost the American public over $70 in damage. So our fossil fuel leasing uh, were passed long ago before we knew all of this about carbon, but now we know. The fact that we are essentially subsidizing this coal will and subsequently export, uh, to me, fails a pretty common sense test by the American people. With that said, we do have a broad set of proposals before us today about hydro relicensing, about energy workforce, about clean energy technology. So once again, I want to thank the committee and the chair uh, for holding this hearing and for the many witness testimonies we're going to receive today. But once again, I think we have a very broad hearing and we'll have lots to do to try to prioritize these various proposals before the committee. Again, I hope that we can come together on focusing on infrastructure because as the quadrennial review said, it's about improving our infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Chair.